We've got your questions and we're gonna answer them. You're in the right place, folks, because this is where the money is. Welcome to the show, I'm Matt Copenheffer. This here is David Hansen, and today is the all mailbag show. We have an email address, it's WTMI at fool.com. Uh, all of our great listeners have been sending us so many questions and we They've been accumulating. They've been accumulating. Dusted. We've got we've we've answered some great questions on the show. We've got a lot still that we'd like to answer today. We're gonna mm. answer a bunch of them. Uh, and we're on the clock today. We're strapped for time, so let's just get started. Do it. First question of the day. This comes from Winston. You recently mentioned ARR, that's Armor Residential, in your program on selling losers. According to Charles Schwab, the 2013 earnings are $1.54, with a current payout of $0.15 cents per quarter or $0.60 cents per year. They do not come close to the required 90% per year. Will they have to do a special dividend to catch up or make the payout otherwise? Could this make them a buy? Good question. Uh, so he says he looked up the, the earnings on Charles Schwab, and that is correct, or it, maybe it changed a little bit in 2013. Uh, but with Armour, they had a gain in the third quarter of this year on a derivative, a huge gain. So those earnings are inflated from what their normalized earnings are. And the 15 cent quarterly dividend, mm -hmm. if I can get that out, is kind of their projection for the next year. And they pay a monthly dividend at Armour, so they're paying five, per, five cents a month. And that's their expectation for their earnings next year. So I don't, you can't base the 2013 earnings can't base the 2014 earnings off of 2013 uh, because there was that big one-time charge. They are not drastically under giving dividends, if that makes any sense. Under giving. Like under giving. <laughs> it's a new word. You heard it here on WTMI. Uh, First time ever. So yeah, there, there was a one there was a one-time charge in third quarter. That's why their numbers look a little, little weird. This isn't a glaring buying opportunity. Uh, yeah, so you got to look at the numbers and see what's going Let on. Let me also point out that just generally speaking, trying to compare the dividends that a REIT pays to the net income that it reports, they're actually paying dividends based on the taxable income. Yes. And f for those that haven't, that aren't really into accounting, uh, I'm, I'm one of them. I'm not really into accounting, but I do know enough to say that taxable earnings and cash earnings are often can can often vary considerably from reported gap earnings. Cool. Uh, what we'll see on the the net income line. Next question. We've got a question from Chris in San Diego. Uh, Chris writes: Assume you were forced to choose between a basket of your five favorite insurance company stocks and your five favorite bank stocks to hold for the next ten years, and the basket you could choose would be your only exposure to the financial sector, banks or insurance companies. Which would you rather own? Obviously. We'd also like to hear you rattle off the companies if there's time. I'm going with the banks. You're going with the banks? Yes. Why? Um, personally, a little bit more comfortable with, the, with understanding banks and the valuation around banks, so I'm going to lean that way. Uh, and also, I think there's some really good opportunities today in, in banks. He said to list some. Yeah, go for um, it. In, in our Best Ideas podcast that we ran a couple days ago, I mentioned Capital One, PNC, JP Morgan. I would love to have those uh, those stocks in a basket to hold for, for 10 years. I think they have a very good chance of beating the market over that time. So I'm going with the banks. What do you say? I'm going to go. I was, I was a little bit on the fence leaning towards insurance companies. Now that you've said banks, <laughs> I will definitely go insurance companies. I don't think the valuations are are as attractive as the banks necessarily, but I think you can uh, find some really good operators that create value uh, almost predictably mm -hmm. over time, uh, have the ups and downs in terms of when, when there are uh, good and bad insurance markets versus when there are catastrophes and that sort of thing. Uh, but there are, in terms of management, there are probably more insurance companies that I, that I really feel confident in and there are banks. We're talking about 10 years here. Mm -hmm. So let me rattle off five for you, for you and Chris. Uh, Berkshire Hathaway, of course. I think we can call that an insurance yep. company. I'll go with Markel, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, Platinum Underwriters, which I've talked about on this show a few other times. Um, I'm going to go Travelers, which I think is an extremely well-managed company. And I'll go with Aflac as well. Um, so again, that's uh, Berkshire Hathaway, BRKB or BRKA, if you've got a whole lot of money sitting money. around. Uh, the second was Markel, MKL, uh, Platinum, PTP, Travelers, TRV, and Aflac, AFL. Cool. On to the next question. We've got a question from Justin. 
David, you can read this one. Are you giving me the long <laughs> one to read? I've got a somewhat dated question for you regarding the housing crisis and mortgage lending industry. If I understand correctly, borrowers are required by most banks to have private mortgage insurance if their down payment is less than 20% of the sale price. I don't think it's a stretch to assume that most, quote, subprime loans would have been subject to this. Ever since the crisis, I've wondered what happened to these PMI companies. Shouldn't responsibility have fallen on them to remunerate the banks for the losses? Isn't that their prime responsibility? Well, in terms of figuring out what happened to the companies in the mortgage insurance industry, you don't have to look too much further than stock charts for companies like Radian, like Genworth Financial, and, uh, and MGIC. Yep. So, so just take a look at those stock charts following the financial crisis. Now, what we've also seen is a, is a spring back in the last couple of years from some of them. Radian, in particular, has been a, a pretty serious outperformer recently. Nowhere close to the pre-crisis kind of stock price. Though. Right. Right, right, right. It's yeah. still way down. So what happened was it was a combination of things. So to some extent, yes, they were held, uh, held to, to uh, remunerating the banks for... Uh, for those insurance policies that they wrote. And they, just like everybody else, were essentially caught unawares of the idea that the housing market could get this bad. Yes. So they were, insurance is a, is a risk management operation and, and underwriting based on your expectations. Their expectations were wrong, so they took some pretty huge losses based on that. However, on the other hand, there were instances, uh, we've seen all these big bank settlements Part of these settlements, a chunk of these settlements, were with the mortgage insurers. Mm -hmm. The mortgage insurers essentially saying, you didn't give us the right information uh, on the mortgages that we were insuring. Right. And so they, the, they, the policies were rescinded or the banks had to settle with them or give them money. Uh, so it's been a combination there. Um, but those, those companies, those private mortgage insurers, have been pretty beaten up. Yeah. And we were saying before, a lot of the losses that banks had to mark down weren't direct mortgage loans. If we think about a Merrill Lynch that had had huge losses at the end of 2008, right. a lot of those were related to insurance like CDOs, which maybe the underlying were mortgages there, but they still had to mark those down to the market value there. So that's why you saw the losses on those securities, maybe the derivatives of mortgages. Okay, on to the next question. We've got a question from Jacob. Jacob writes, Warren Buffett said he liked and owned JP Morgan in his personal account. However, Berkshire owns Wells Fargo, U.S. Bancorp, M and m and instead. He said he would leave the best ideas to Berkshire, so it seems he likes the other three better. I think it is because they are more boring and predictable than J.P. Morgan. David, more boring and predictable? Yeah, after we've seen what <laughs> J.P. Morgan's done this year, they are a little bit more boring in, in, in a good way. So, was that, I guess, a, more of a statement than a question. Okay. Um, but, but yeah, I, I do I don't, agree with that. Why, why do you think Berkshire doesn't own J.P. Morgan? I think he's probably just more comfortable with the, with the business model of those other three. You look at J.P. Morgan, huge exposure to the markets business, investment banking business, and it does not going to say that Berkshire and Warren Buffett hate those businesses. But we look at Wells Fargo, U.S. Bancorp, M&T. These are very much vanilla banks, vanilla-ish um, that have consumer retail I lending operations. <laughs> you like chocolate banks? I like chocolate. <laughs> I like chocolate. Uh, commercial lending. These are these are banks that have I very like George Clinton song. <laughs> Easy there. Parliament Funkadelic. <laughs> these most of these these three banks that Berkshire holds have potentially more predictable cash flows than one that relies on the markets business, investment banking business. I'm actually a little surprised that that Berkshire doesn't own any JP Morgan. And I, it wouldn't surprise me if it was added to the portfolio. Actually earlier this year when Berkshire had its thirteen uh thirteen F filing out and it's, they said that they were building a large position in something and they didn't disclose it. I speculated that it could have been JP Morgan. I was very wrong. It was ExxonMobil. But uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they added it. But I should point out also, Berkshire has a stake in Goldman Sachs and a preferred stake in Bank of America. So it is exposed to a wide range of banks. So maybe Buffett just doesn't want to add another bank to the mix. There you go. All right, next question. I think this may be our last question. This is from Mike V. Can you discuss the tradable TARP warrants and where there might be value. David, I'm gonna leave you to this one because- You hate them. I, I, don't, I don't hate them, I'm just not interested in them. If I'm going, it, it adds another layer. To me, I'd rather be learning about the businesses, I'd rather be better understanding the businesses than, uh, than, than looking at the warrants and putting another layer on top of 
just investing in the business. You go in public bathrooms and scrape on the stalls. I hate <laughs> bank warrants, don't you? I know you do. Right next to where you where you are scraping in, I love the Federal Reserve. With, I love the, talking with about the big, the With the big heart around it. So the TARP warrants, if we remember the TARP program, these were warrants that were issued to the government from the I banks. remember. You remember. Great time for everyone. These were issued to the U.S. Treasury. They held them. They eventually got to the point where the banks were in a little bit better condition, and they sold these warrants onto the public markets where investors like you and I can buy them. And what they are... Can. But you can, but you don't want to. What they are essentially are are call options. They give you the right to buy one share of a bank for paying or buying the warrant today. So say the warrant costs $15 today, it gives you the right to buy stock X at $50 at a time in the future. And what makes them unique is that most of these don't expire for five years or so. Most of them expire at the end of 2018, right? Am I saying that right? Uh, which is 10 years, they were 10 year warrants, so they were issued at the end of 2008. They expire at the end of 2018. So the thesis behind them is it's essentially like an option. They're more volatile, uh, they can give you more upside, but if the stock, the underlying stock does not reach the, st the strike price, you lose 100%. Cutting you off. You just, Cutting you just don't like is it. There, is there opportunity? Yes, I, I Let's own... get to the brass tacks. I here. own some tarp you warrants. You do own some tarp warrants. I do. Okay. I own tarp warrants for PNC and Capital One. We usually hear about the ones like AIG. Bruce Berkowitz held the AIG warrants. Mm -hmm. Bank of America has warrants. Wells Fargo. Those are the ones that usually get a lot of the news. I like the Capital One warrants the best. Uh, they don't have to have a huge hurdle for you to make a strong return o over the next five years. Uh, there's, there's downside, obviously, if it's below the strike price, you lose 100% in your investment. These are a risky investment to make. Um, but I think the downside is limited. I don't like saying that, but I think the downside is limited uh, for Capital One compared to some of the other ones. All right. Heather, that's our last question, right? Yep. All right. Looks like we are all wrapped up here. Uh, we have, of course, the email address where we get all these questions, WTMI at fool.com. We, we have a Facebook page, too. It is Motley Fool Financial Sector, and obviously readers can go on there and give us questions there, and we can bring them to the show mm -hmm. as well. Do we have and, a MySpace page? <laughs> what is can this? Can we make one? 1980? <laughs> was my, MySpace? That's like 1980, right? That's right. <laughs> 2005. We don't have a MySpace page. We do have a Twitter, at okay. TMF Financials, and Facebook. An, an AOL AIM? I actually have an AOL AIM do, yeah. that I still use. All right. All right. David, Sarcastic David over here. That's how we're going to end the show. I'm Matt Kopenheffer. This is Sarcastic David Hansen. Uh, thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. People on the show may have interest in the stocks they talk about, and The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against. Don't buy or sell stocks based solely on what you hear.